In the last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss case-based reasoning models, and in particular, I'm going to talk about interpretable neural networks. Um, neural networks are being constrained to be interpretable right now in many, many different ways. Um, for instance, there are groups that work on designing networks that highlight the important areas of an image uh, for image classification. Um, so they say, okay, the network is using just this part of the image. Now, I find that kind of logic insufficient as um, a, a, an interpretability mechanism, and I'll show you why. Um, so here, the network is trying to classify this test image, and it's telling us that the evidence for the animal being a Siberian Husky is that the algorithm is focusing on the dog's face. However, if you ask the net same network for the reason why it would classify this dog as a transverse flute, it would give you the same, uh, the same interpretation. So I, I just don't find it sufficient um, for the network to simply point to the, the information it's using. I wanted to explain how it's using that information. And by the way, I should mention, there's a very, very large literature on this kind of in encouraging neural networks to focus on local regions of, of, a, of an input uh, image or, or signal of some kind. So, um, so this is a, in, sense a, in some sense a criticism of a, a very large swath of the field. Okay, so um, there are other works that force the network to have a special architecture. For example, um, including a decision tree. Like there's, there are some groups that um, kind of imbue the network with a type of architecture that force it to reason in a logical structure. So I'm putting up an example here from one of the recent papers on that, on that topic. Okay, so here you can see that there's like a tree-shaped architecture that's going into sort of one prediction. Uh, there are some papers that force the latent space to have specific directions that are meaningful. So if you uh, try to visualize the latent space of these neural networks, then you'll find out that you know there there would be one axis that's like the person axis, and this you know another axis is like the airplane axis, and then if you travel far in both directions, you find a picture with a person and an airplane in it. So it kind of is a nice way to think about um, about images. And so like for example, if you have pictures of faces, you might move in one direction and increase the person's age, and if you change another direction, you might change um, something else about the person or how feminine they look or something like that. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about here is uh, case-based reasoning. Now, case-based reasoning is essentially variations of k-nearest neighbors. K-nearest neighbors is when you take a test point, and in order to classify it, you look at the points nearby, and you take some kind of majority vote or average of the neighbors. And these kind of case-based reasoning methods are useful when humans can understand the similarity between units, um, even if they can't quantify a distance metric manually. So if they can, if, if they can say, well, yes, I think this is close to that, even if they can't say why exactly. And also, um, also these are useful when, when you have like a big model, glo big global model that can't fit on a PowerPoint slide, um, then at least you can say, well, you know, I think this is similar to that one that I've seen before. So this is the kind of logic that real estate agents use when pricing houses. They say, well, this house, you know, this house has a big backyard. There was another house that had a big backyard, and, and this is, you know, I'm gaining information about the price from that. And then this other house ha is, is, um, is on a corner, and your house is on a corner, so I'm going to use that information to help price your house, and this other house is in the same neighborhood, and so on. Okay, so uh, by the way, this is a very active area of research, and I've just put, a, put down um, just a few papers here by some of the groups that are working on this problem. Um, I'm going to show you on the next couple slides the latest approach from my own group on this problem, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's not exactly k-nearest neighbors. It's more like k-nearest parts of prototypical neighbors, something like that. Okay, so here our network is trying to classify birds. And this is great because I don't know anything about birds, so it's kind of useful to see the network do this. Okay, so why, why does the network think this bird is a clay-colored sparrow? And the network is saying, because I think, you know, this part of the bird, where it points to the top, you know, like the bird's face or whatever, 
This part of the bird looks like this part of that other bird, and this bird is a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. And the network sort of picks out, you know, which are the which are the aspects of the bird that I think are similar to prototypical aspects of this of this clay-colored sparrow class. And so it says, I think, well, I think this looks like that, and 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 that's why I think this bird is a clay-colored sparrow. Okay, so um, because the network says this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that, we decided to call the paper this looks like that. So that's what we did. <laughs> we called it that. <laughs> and the way the algorithm works is that it adds a prototype layer to any black box neural network that you would like. So you start with your favorite black box, you add this prototype layer on the end, and it forces the network to reason about cases. So what I showed you on the previous slide, that was the way the network was thinking. It's not a post hoc explanation. It's actually the way the network was actually reasoning about its, um, its decision. And everything is learned during training, like the distance metric between units, and the prototypes themselves, how did, how, did, how did it choose which clay colored sparrows are prototypical? And it did that during training. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little more detail about how this network operates. So let's say the network is trying to classify this bird and it's gonna give you as much evidence as it can as to why it's a red-bellied woodpecker. And so the network says, well, I think you know the top of the head is, like, is similar to, the, to this part of this other bird and um, it's, it, it's, this other bird is a prototypical, you know, red-bellied woodpecker. And there are two scores, two numbers that come out of each computation. One is the score for how similar the two parts of the birds are, which is that 6.499. And the other, um, the other important piece of information is how important that prototype is to the class. And here that number is 1.18 for the first prototype. And there are 20 prototypes per class, and so there are 40 numbers computed. There are the similarity scores, so how similar are the current images to the prototypes, and then how important is each prototype. Those get multiplied together to form the point scores, and then the points get added up, and you get the total score for the red-bellied woodpecker class. And then it does it for all the classes. It computes a score for each class. So here it's computing a score for the red cockadet woodpecker, but the red cockadet woodpecker doesn't seem to have a red head, and so it just simply can't gather, get, gather enough evidence to give it a lot of points for the red-bellied woodpecker class. And so it thinks that, okay, this is why I'm, I'm voting red cockadet woodpecker. And then um, this network, despite the fact that it's interpretable, it's actually just as accurate as, as the benchmark um, uh, algorithms. So this this is a benchmark data set. This is a very famous data set that you know the deepest of the deep neural neural networks are tested on. It's 200 classes of birds and then here if you take the black box neural networks and you compute their accuracies you get between these values and then if you add the extra prototype layer and retrain it then you you basically preserve a lot of the accuracy uh, and then if you take the interpretable networks that you got from all those black boxes and you put them together into one big interpretable neural network, right? Because it's still linear, so it's still, and it's still doing this prototype uh, reasoning, then you actually get an accuracy that's better than any of the base neural networks. So, um, you know, you're getting to, to the level there of like the top classifiers for, for this particular benchmark data set. Okay, so even for computer vision, where the deepest of the deep and the biggest of the big neural networks are being tested, you can still have an interpretable model as this, of the same accuracy as a black box. Thanks. <laughs>